Hello everybody, it's Daryl Jones here. Um, I'm going to record this session on the magpies, having been through the experience of being hacked and attacked during the actual live version. So, don't know what that was all about. Um, I didn't realise magpies were such a politically violent thing to be going on with, but let's get on with this anyway. Let's just see what we can do. So this is me, um, and I thought it'd be a good idea to just introduce who I am first. Um, so I'm, I'm Daryl Jones. I'm an urban ecologist at Griffith University, where I've been for a very long time. I've been involved in all sorts of urban ecology things, but it, it really began in earnest with the magpie story. Uh, and I was invited by the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service to get involved in this very serious and widespread thing that goes on everywhere in Australia, wherever a magpies are. And that's the well-known thing that goes on where magpies, for some strange reason, attack people. And the typical and, tra and traditional approach to this problem was that you went and found your uh, local copper who was on side, who you could explain what was going on, and he would come out and shoot the bird Typically, that's what happened everywhere. It still happens probably in some country towns, I think. Um, but because this is primarily a thing that happens in urban environments, the dispatching of wildlife, especially protected birds, especially favourite birds like magpies, was seen to be a bit problematic. Uh, and so they, at least in Queensland, initially this is where it began, they said, we need to do something different. So because I was naive and but really interested in animal behaviour and I had been working with other wildlife problems in urban environments, especially with brush turkeys, rearranging people's gardens, um, the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service said, maybe I'd be interested and I foolishly said yes. And so for oh, nearly, nearly a whole decade, I was the person that all the reports about mag aggressive magpies attacking people, um, I received all those reports and my tiny little group of very dedicated people on an absolute pittance, we went out and investigated a huge number of these things uh, throughout southern Queensland. Um, it was primarily Brisbane and the Gold Coast is where they were and we would get absolutely well in excess of a thousand reports every single year and there's no way we could have a of, of, um, dealt with or even you know look, investigated all of those but we worked out a system where we could go and do that um, and as a result of that um, I eventually published this book Magpie Alert Learning to Live with a Wild Neighbour which summarised everything that we'd learned over that period of time and that was uh, a book intended to be very um, open just any uh, anyone could read um, and we, we summarised everything in there in non-technical terms. And so that's, if, if you can still find a copy, unfortunately it's out of print at the moment, but it's, um, it seems to have sold very well, and especially in city councils, libraries, because they're everywhere in libraries. And so if you want to get your hands on it, if you can't find them on the, in the second-hand bookshop or anywhere, um, do that. Um, what this also did was it, it was very important for me in terms of understanding a lot more about the relationship between magpies and people. And this is, I guess, exemplified by the famous story about to come out in a film, um, literally just appeared in one of the big film festivals over in, in, in Canada, I think, was the first time it was filmed, the story of Magpie Bloom. Um, and you will probably have heard that story about a magpie that comes into the family, a, a, a family during some tragic circumstances, and and it's a really heartwarming and wonderful and true true story. And um, that just exemplifies that the fact that people really love their magpies, and magpies move in with us with the merest in hint of a of a, of an opportunity. And because magpies live in tiny little groups they can get to know us very well. So um, the side of the story, so this is m much more than just the fear and danger associated with magpies attacking us. 
This bird, as this audience will no doubt be thoroughly aware of, is one of the favourite birds in Australia most of the time. Um, everybody regards the magpie and its spectacular caroling and all those sorts of things as one of the gorgeous, wonderful, perfect things about living in Australia. Um, it's just that sometimes, especially during spring, some of them become aggressive, but there's so much more to it than that. So that's what we want to explore in this little talk. Okay, so let's just, I've got three three things I'm going to tell you about. What what are magpies? This is where just introduction to, to the whole thing now. Then a bit about their ecology in general, where they what they do and how they make a living. And then I'm going to talk about the the issue to do with their aggressive attacks on us and what we can do about it. So let's just let's just go with that. So the first thing to um, to talk about is what is a magpie, and um, I guess it's controversial. It's a bit technical, if you like, but um, the most recent serious look at what a magpie is concluded that they were the big. They I won't say just, but they were the big. Butcher bird. So they're in that group. They've been put into that group, which is the genus Cracticus. And so they, here they all are. Here's all the butcher birds, including the magpie up the top. Um, and it, you know, there's obvious differences, similarities. They're all kind of black and white. They're all, um, most of them live in urban environments. They have a very similar kind of lifestyle. But there's many differences as well. So it's not entirely accepted by everybody that they're just another. Uh, butcher bird and uh, there's a link to a paper that I will put up that'll accompany this talk that explains a bit about that because some other serious people have said it's not that simple um, they are clearly related absolutely but there's too many important differences so at the moment all the current bird books have them as one of the butcher birds in the Cracticus uh, genus um, but that's still being debated some somewhat let's so let's just not let's not get into the too much technical stuff there, but that's worth knowing about. So where do they occur? They occur really all over the place in Australia. Um, this uh, diagram shows you in part their distribution, and you can see if you look at all the parts that are not just pure white, that's where magpies occur. Um, so it's most of Australia except the extreme tropical north, so the Cape, Cape York and the top of Northern Territory and a bit of the very top of Western Australia um, don't have any magpies. And the really seriously treeless desert areas right throughout that middle bit, the magpies aren't found too much in there. Uh, but they're found pretty much everywhere else. But that on that gross scale, um, it, what it doesn't tell you is that they don't also occur in true forest, thick forest, closed forest. Most of the time they simply are not there and there's a good reason for that. This uh, diagram also shows you that there is um, some types, different versions of magpies, the same species, not, no doubt about that, not even, gene, not even subspecies. They've got just different morphologies, different patterns of the black and white. Um, and you can see there's black back ones, white back ones, and what's on this thing is just called varied, but there's a strong genetic uh, control of this whole activity. Uh, and there's, you know, there's been a lot of research done on how that all fits together. Uh, just in case you don't, aren't aware, um, it is fairly, almost everywhere, it's, it's pretty easy to tell the males and females apart. They're pretty much exactly the same size. But if you have a look at that, the black-backed one um, there, there, there's the male and the female. Um, the, the the nape, the back of the throat, the back of the back, this part of the of the of the um, behind the head, I guess, um, collar part is is pure white, absolutely pure white in the male adult males, but it tends to be a bit greyer or gra grades from white into black rather than just being a strict cutoff between the white and the black um, in the females, and it's the same deal with the white-backed magpies and the varied. So if it's just pure black and white with a straight line between the two, wherever you go, whatever the magpies look like, um, that'll be the male. And if there's a bit of grey, a bit of grey in that area, it's the female. So that's, that's what that one's about. Now let's just move over to their ecology. 
Um, so the, one of the reasons that they don't occur very much in forested country is because they spend most of the day looking for grubs and worms and beetles and anything like that, small lizards sometimes, but 80% of their diet in, in a natural environment, even in a city, well and truly the majority of their diet is either grubs, as in the uh, larvae of uh, beetles typically, but especially worms. And they find these worms in grassy areas and just below the surface, and they find those items for their diet by hearing them. They can, they can hear the sound that is made by a grub or a worm pushing through the soil. I can hear that. And you can, if you have a look closely at a, at a magpie th that's in a stance like the one that's on the screen, you will sometimes see them going to one side and then the other and then the other. And they're triangulating exactly where on the ground that sound is coming from. And then you can see them plunge that dagger like beak down into the soil. And they can often, often as not, then pull out a wriggling worm. And so these guys listen, listen for their lunch as it is oft sometimes described. So if that's where they, what they feed on, and that is you know, the, their main diet, um, there's, they, they can't live where it's too dry, where the soil is too hard. They, they simply wouldn't be able to penetrate the soil. Um, and so the perfect place for them um, would be anywhere where there's plenty of, a scattering of trees with lots of grass on the ground, preferably short grass, and preferably well-watered grass so that the soil is um, moist and, and friable and that there's not, and the grass is not too long. Um, and so what does that think, what do you think about? Well, you can think of farms where pastures are grazed by cattle uh, in some of the wetter areas. Or how about the lawns of every house and park in every city and town and village in the whole of Australia? So we have made, in when we build our towns and cities, we have made magpie heaven. Those lawns, extensive lawns, well watered, mown all the time, fertilised so they're green and beautiful, friable soil, perfect. And that is one of the reasons why the density of magpies in cities is much higher than it is in any other environment. And that's why we've got lots of magpies living right among us everywhere you go. There's the density, there's still plenty of magpies in the rural environments, but the density, the number of pairs of magpies per cap, per uh, area, per hectare, if you like, is much smaller in the city. And so what that means is in a good, in a good wetter area in any city anywhere, um, a magpie's territory will be around about um, 20 to 30 suburban house blocks, that sort of size, or half a big park if you like and they've got everything they need in there lots of places for foraging and they've spent a lot of time foraging looking for these worms and grubs uh, and the scattering of trees allowing them to find a, a nest site from where they can see all around and visualize being able to clearly see right around where they where they live and and what I think is the the ability to, to detect the presence of a threat like a predator snakes cats, um, goannas, anything like that that might be coming along and they can then deal with them. Very important to realise that once um, a magpie pair finds a spot, a patch, a territory, they then settle down in that territory and stay there until something happens. One of them dies or the, or the territory changes, the place gets bulldozed or something happens. But if it's all stable, they, that pair will stay there for good. They will stay there for good. They will never leave. They will never leave. And this is another extraordinary thing about the magpie. In every other way, it's it's a pretty typical passerine bird. It's just a, a songbird. Um, it's big-ish, but it gets around. It it's, um, lives a normal life and eats an, it's an insectivorous songbird, basically. Something that's very unusual, though, is that it's territorial all year round. Now, in this case, territoriality simply means... Um, keeping other members of that of your own species away, you defend a territory. For, for a territory to be a territory, it must be defended from other members of the same species. Not so. 
Aggression towards members of other species, like cats and dogs and humans, nothing to do with territoriality. Territoriality is um, a pair, usually the male, keeping other magpies away from that patch. And that patch, as I've said, it doesn't have to be very big, but they can. that's where they live. And they do, and they broadcast that. I'm running, I'm being too long talking about that. I just wanted to show you, you know, this is a suburb, a typical suburb. And so a typical, a magpies could live in, in a, you know, 20 or 30 of those houses without any problem. And they stay there for good. And one of the things that they do, which we enjoy so much, is be territorial every single morning. So they're not just territorial, they're territorial every single day. Every single day, they tell you tell other magpies in their vicinity, oh, we're here, we're healthy and strong and fit, and you, you wouldn't you shouldn't even think about trying to come and trespass on this land because we will see you off. Don't even think about trying. And that's what that glorious caroling does every morning, the things that we enjoy so much. If that was translatable into a, you know, into a English, you probably wouldn't be able to broadcast it on a family show like this. It would be fairly straightforward, blatant, keep away and bugger off. Don't, don't think about coming anywhere nearby. It intensifies, obviously, during the early breeding season, but they don't need to look for a territory like all other birds. And most other passerines, the songbirds, don't do anything like that. It's too too intense. It's, it makes takes too much energy. It takes too much time to sing all the time. Most birds sing very strongly, and at the time that they're setting up their territory for the breeding season. So that early springtime, about about now, or or a little bit earlier, the birds, any bird that sings, will be singing their hearts out, broadcasting to tell to let any other competitors, other males typically, know where they are that, and that they've patched, got a patch, but also perhaps attracting the attention of, of a local female to come over and hang on. But as soon as the nest's built and the eggs are laid, all the singing stops, that's all over, and it stops very suddenly, uh, and, that, and that's, that's what happens. And it, there was lots of theories about why all birds don't sing all the time. Well, no one told the magpies because they do sing all the time, and that's something we can we can value, but you do need to know why that's going on. Um, just a little bit of more recent research has just come out. There's a link to this paper as well. This was extraordinary work done by um, people in Western Australia. And you can tell that's a Western Australian bird because it's a white back magpie. You can see the black is, um, the, the, the whole back is pretty much all white. So that'll be a male. It's a pure white black back, back on the back on the magpie. And what they discovered, um, and this is extraordinary study really, is that um, there's been a lot of, there's been a theory that really intelligent birds that, that have a lot of cognitive, cognitive ability that can learn and understand and, and solve problems, like there's an experiment going on in that picture there, um, that can, the highest level of cognitive ability is in birds that have, that occur in groups. And in the southern parts of Australia, whether they're white-backed or black-backed, it doesn't really make any difference. Um, but the magpies that occur in groups, larger groups, and it can be beyond just the pair for a long period of time, um, have more of an ability to interact with one another, to learn and understand things from one another, to watch each other and, and, and take risks and learn from those, that risk-taking behaviour. And their ability, therefore, to be able to solve problems is much more pronounced. They can solve problems quick, more quickly if they're in groups. Now, that's really interesting because the southern dwelling magpies occur in groups much more frequently, much more, much more of the time than the ones uh, in the northern parts of Australia. Where I live in, in Brisbane, the magpies occur strictly in pairs. Um, the kids, the, the offspring from last year, hang around for a while, but then are un, very unceremoniously booted out to go and make a living for themselves um, during the winter, and then mum and dad get on to building a nest and raising the next lot of young. In the southern parts of Australia, that is not the case often at all, and so you can have quite large groups, sometimes, well, you know, from three, four, five, six 
consisting of offspring from a previous breeding season who can come in and uh, and live together and learn stuff. So it tells you something that so I'm, I'm, the implications of that are the magpies in Melbourne must be smarter than the ones in Brisbane. I don't want to say that. Is that true? Oh, that seems to be the implication of what I'm what I'm going on about. Anyway, eventually they will need to make a nest. And here's a suburban magpie in a nest um, overlooking its the, where, where it spends its its time. And the nests are being built. Uh, typically uh, August, early September, uh, and then the chicks will arrive and and then they'll be fed by the birds in the nest. Uh, and that's a really vulnerable time. They uh, they'll, there could be two, three, or four some sometimes. Um, in the bush or the rural areas, that's they usually have one nest, one clutch, and they raise that clutch. But in the extremely uh, fertile areas in the cities, where there's lots of grass and lots of beautiful resources available, um, they can have two clutches or three even sometimes. And they so if they start early enough and the conditions are good and there's plenty of food, they can raise one lot of chicks. Leave, they will leave the nest and be looked after by one of the pairs, usually the female. Then the male, no, the other way around. The male looks after the first clutch and, and spends a lot of time away with those growing juveniles, the nestlings. They're, they're out of the nest now. They'll be juveniles. And the, and the female will then concentrate on the next lot. And so that will be, that'll be separated out. So during that period of time, when there's, when there's chicks in the nest especially, that's a really important time. So... Um, the male's job primarily is to keep predators away, to keep a vigil lookout for predators, anything that might be a threat to those chicks in the nest. That's very important. So there's a huge, there's an absolute peak of activity during that time um, when the chicks are in the nest. So though the male will spend a lot of time scouting around, looking out. Both of the male and female, they share the parental responsibility. So both of them will be out looking for food to feed their chicks. Um, and, and so at, during that time, they will be looking out for anything that might be a threat coming towards the nest. Snakes, cats, goannas, all those sorts of things that I've already talked about. And they, are, they don't hold back when, they, when they're um, attacking those guys. So that's, that's really important. That's the male's job. So that's when we get into, so why are they dealing with us? So, yes, that's when the magpie persona changes quite abruptly. And for a long time, it was just regarded as a, a bit of a mystery of what was going on. Um, people couldn't work out why they would be attacking us. And, uh, and we we opened this we we began our research with a very open mind trying to understand what might be going on but it became really clear we we've got some very clear strong un you know pretty much unrefutable evidence of what's going on and but there remains plenty of mysteries involved in this so i'm happy to tell you there's plenty of stuff we don't know at all at the moment but what is going on is that the absolute majority of attacks on humans uh, happen by males only, and only occur when there are chicks in the nest. Not when there's eggs in the nest, not any time while the nests are being built. Um, and as soon as the chicks leave the nest, it all stops completely. So this is very much what exactly what you would call as brood defence. The, the, the simple and obvious question, thing is they, for some reason have put tre trespassing humans into the category of a threat to the chicks. Now, it's only a really small proportion. It's around about 10% of pairs show any aggression towards people at all. It's always immediately in the vicinity of the nest. Um, but you have to remember that Therefore, 90% of magpies, even the ones that live around us, never, ever show any territory, it's not territoriality, any, show, any sort of aggression towards people going past the nest. The absolute majority of them do not show any aggression whatsoever. 
So it's, a, it's, it's, it's very much around keeping people, if we now talk just about the people thing, pe- keeping people n- now regarded by those particular magpies as a threat to the chicks and, uh, and there's, a, there's an attack zone. So there, there's, big dif- there's really big differences. So if you're a pedestrian, um, the, the most intense attacks... Are, are close to the nest, usually about 50 metres from the nest tree, and then it peters out pretty quickly after that. With cyclists who are travelling much faster, the the attack zone is much higher, but again, in a lot of cases, it stops fairly abruptly, usually about 150 metres or so from the nest. Now, there are heaps of exceptions to this, this general pattern. But what our understanding of this is, is... Most magpies don't immediately attack every. They don't attack everybody at all. They are attacking only certain people, and I'll talk about the specialisations at the moment. But if we're just talking about the pedestrian magpies, let's let's focus on those at the moment. What we think is going on is that they are sending a signal. They are saying, "Don't come any closer. Keep away from my nest." But we're really thick we don't get the the message. We don't understand what's going on. Lots of people seem to think that it's spring. When I walk out my front door, every magpie is trying to kill me for the next six weeks. That's Thankfully, that's not true. It's only a tiny number of magpies, thankfully, and it's only in the vicinity of the nest, and it's only while there's chicks in that nest. That's really important to know. But it also means that if you do get swooped, you can be absolutely sure that you're within the vicinity of a magpie's nest and there's chicks in there and they're trying to tell you something to get out and that's really important. So it's best to keep a, keep away. Um, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail as well, but let's just go on to one of our, one of our really big discoveries was that we found out that uh, this is, a, so this is the, you know, a pie chart of, uh, all the magpies that attack humans, we found that they are, they specialise. The majority, around about half of the magpies that attack people, attack only pedestrians. Then there's another group that attack only cyclists. There's another attack, a group that only attack ped, uh, posties on these little motorbikes. And then there's a bigger group which attacks pretty much anything that walks along. That's a still a, sub, a substantial group, but those magpies in almost every case that we've investigated are in places that are not the usual environments, a, a suburban environment or a farmer environment or something like that. They are almost always in places where there are simply lots and lots of people and they can't distinguish among them because we have discovered that when it comes to the pedestrian magpies, which is the majority of the magpies that attack people, those magpies attack the same individual, sometimes more than one, but mostly a single individual, and that that person is selected out to be the, the, for the attention of 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 the male. What we have no idea about is why. We don't know what led that person to be regarded as a threat. Lots of these people are older people or young people. And I guarantee, I'm pretty sure that the majority of those people who are being attacked did not climb the tree and eat a baby magpie and therefore prove that they were a predator. But something happened and it was interpreted by this incredibly intelligent bird that they, not only did they interpret the behavior of that person, as being threatening to their chicks, but they remember that person amongst all the other people that live in that area. So in in the vicinity of, within any magpie's uh, territory, there'll be a limited number of people, but unless it's a place like a schoolyard or a car park or a, you know, somewhere there where there's hundreds of people every day, there's no way in the world they could remember individuals in that area. If it's just the 20 or 30 people who live in one, one patch around where those magpies live, they know every single person by, the, by their facial features. They know them by looking at them. And that's this, they can recognise 
who you are, and even if you put on a disguise, people put on different types of hats and change the colour of their clothes and do all sorts of things. No point. They, they know exactly who you are. Though it is interesting to note, and, and I hope we can get a bit more detail on this, but with the advent of the face coverings, the masks that a lot of people are wearing, especially now in Victoria, um, it appears that that is actually making it much harder for the magpies to distinguish between individuals. And so it does appear at the moment, we can't be absolutely sure, sure at the moment, we need more data, but it looks like there's a bit more less um, particular uh, a, a aggression going on now because they can't quite work out whether that's the individual that they should be targeting or not. When it comes to the others, the cyclists and the and the posties, um, it it seems to be the simple pro problem that they're going. They've got helmets on um, and they're bent over and they can't really see their face that well. And because they're always attacking from behind, um, they can't see those facial features. So. Cyclist magpies and posty magpies attack all of them. Anybody, anybody who's a cyclist will get attacked. But it's only while they're moving. And um, if you if you want if you change the, your behaviour, speed seems to be the thing. If you stop and get off your bike and just walk the bike, you don't get attacked. Now I am a cyclist. I ride all the time, and I tell people earnestly on shows like this and on the millions of radio interviews that I do every year on this very topic, I say, just stop the bike, get off and walk. Well, I never do that. You know, I do what everybody, every cyclist always does and that's just hit the hit the pedal and go as hard as you can out the hell, get the hell out of there because you've been attacked by a magpie. That's the normal thing to do. Um, but, you know, I've, I've tested it out a few times and it, and it does work if you actually stop. What I think is going on with the, especially with the cyclist magpies is the magpie is getting a really strong, positive message of just how bloody good they are at getting rid of these predators, these, these, these threats. You swoop a guy on a motorbike, on a push bike, and out the hell he goes really fast, and they get the message, I'm seriously good at doing this. Here comes another one, I'll show you again. Wow, I'm excellent at this. I am so good. I keep the, the, uh, the predators away. Look, you know, look, watch me go. No wonder they don't, they don't give up. So... That's what's going on. So what are we going to do about it? Um, well, we could, this becomes a, a very important thing on the news. And, you know, this, just look at that. Just look at that picture for a minute. This is the national news from one of our channels. Um, I hope I don't have to explain why that's a really dumb image. Um, what is much more important is this, and that's the website. Magpie Alert, uh, and this is just the the the, the Australia um, whole the whole of Australia. But if you if you zoom into where you live, you'll see many 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 more much more detail. This is just the zoomed right out version of it. But if you're worried about where you're going and what what you should be doing and whether the you know your your bike or bike trip on the weekend is is somewhere you should go or not, check this out. This is the very latest version. But just look up MagpieAlert.com and you'll find out where the magpies are all over Australia. It's also, it's very, very, very sobering just to see how many attacks are out there, but that's a really important thing to know. So what, I'm try what, I need, what I'll do now to finish up is just talk about some of the things that we can do that work. Um, bearing in mind that if you're a pedestrian who gets attacked, they know what you look like and what you can do about that. So let's just start off with the cyclists. Um, they, this is the typical thing that people do at the moment, is put cable ties on the tops of their helmets. Um, now, this doesn't stop them swooping, but it does stop them making contact with your helmet. And that's a really shocking feeling. Everybody who's had that experience knows what that's like. There's a millisecond click of the beak and then bang in the back of your helmet uh, or take, take, you know, take your ear off as they go past. Um, the idea of the spiky things is that it looks really dangerous. That you don't want you, it looks like you could impale yourself if you're the magpie. So what they what typically happens is the magpies do a shallow swoop. They still swoop, they still squawk, they still click their beaks, but they don't make contact, which is really important because it's the making of contact that scares the crap out of you. So it just simply looks, it's got to look 
dangerous to the magpie and then they won't actually hit you. And you've got to have enough of them so that it looks completely bizarre. The more crazy and weird that it looks, that people look at you as you drive past, that means it's, 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 a, it's a good good look. So that's one thing you can do if you're a cyclist. Um, if you're a pedestrian, of course, you've got a different other problem. Um, and this, this is work that we did based on other work that was done uh, in the most, most detail was done with American crows in, in the United States. And this is where it was the crows over there do pretty much what the magpies do here. They attack during the breeding season when there's uh, chicks in the nest. And so John Marsloff and his students on the, um, around the University of Washington campus tr tried on a whole lot of different, they, they seemed to, when, when they did their work, and this has happened to us lots of times, as soon as you catch the bird, they remember who the hell you are uh, and they, you've proved to them that you're a danger and then that, after that they then attack you after all, which is perfectly logical from their perspective. And so they wondered why, because it looked like these magpies could, the, the crows, sorry, the crows could identify the people who were uh, catching them and were therefore the biggest threat because the next time they went out they would get attacked and the other people who hadn't been involved didn't get attacked. And so they tried to prove this with different masks. They tried all sorts of masks. So um, we tried the same thing and proved it exactly with magpies. You can put on a, on a mask um, and it showed that that's the case. Now, the reason I'm showing you this hideous looking mask, I've no idea what that mask is supposed to be, but it's just a rubber mask. Uh, and the posties in a couple of places around Australia have got onto me and said, this is what they have trialed and it seems to work really for them. So you can get a mask like this one or a witch or a you know, zombie or any other, but those big rubber masks and they put them on backwards on the back of their helmet. And the reason that that seems to work, it seems to us, is that it's actually a face. It's got eyes and ears and a mouth, and it's, it looks like a genuine human face. Now, magpies always attack from behind. They, 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 they're stealth bombers. They come from behind, and they, they are surprising you. They want to want to make sure that you get a fright, and it pretty much works every time. So if they see that, that it looks like you're looking at them from behind, um, then they won't attack. They simply won't attack. And that's what the posties, who have got a terrible job, they slowly go winding up and down their streets. And I've seen magpies attack them for hours at a time. It must be just an incredibly stressful thing to do. Um, so that's one of the things that they can do. Um, if you're a cyclist, you could try that as well. If you're a pedestrian, though, um, you, you, the, the, that's not going to work because they can see your face and they'll know that you're just wearing a rubber mask on the back of your head and they know exactly who you are anyway. So what you've got to do if you're a pedestrian is the usual things. Keep the magpies away from your head as much as you can. So wearing a big hat, carrying an umbrella, carrying some sticks if you haven't got anything at all. Uh, but if you know that there's a place where magpies are attacking pedestrians because you've looked on the on the um, website or you've someone showed you or, or a sign has just gone up in your local park, the simplest thing to know now that we know that it's only near a nest that you'll get attacked um, and only while there's chicks in the nest, you should say, okay, there's a nest there, there's an attack zone there, I'm just going to avoid it for the next six weeks. I'll go a different route. I'll just go somewhere else avoid it and that's the simplest and best way to get it out if you don't but if on the other hand you're in a new place and you're walking around and whack or you see somebody get attacked um you can say ah this is new to me but somewhere nearby is a magpie's nest it's really hard to work out where the magpie is where the nest is you can't typically see it but the really important thing to do this might sound counterintuitive but turn and face the magpie. Because they always come from behind, if you're looking at the magpie, then keep it in view, because then you can see it coming if it does, but it won't attack you from the front. You keep it in view and then back out, but keeping a close eye on the magpie. And that way is the best way. So if you're walking along peacefully down the street through a park, swoop, ah, there's a magpie nest nearby. It came from behind me. I'm just going to go back the direction I came because I know 
I might be getting closer to the nest tree. It came in just now, so I'm just going to back out until I'm safe and then get, get out there. So that's the simplest and best thing that you can do um, if you're a pedestrian. Um, and I do need to mention the fairly controversial topic about bird feeding, um, feeding magpies in this particular case. Um, this was suggested to me by lots of people and I investigated it and sure enough it works. But it only works in a very strict series of circumstances. It only works where the magpies know who you are. So this is one of those situations where the local magpies in your patch where you're living in their territory start a attacking you or somebody you know um, or somebody importantly that they know. It's gone, it simply won't work in a busy place where there's 1,000 people every day. There's no way in the world the magpies can remember all those people. But if this is a magpie that's near you and they have, for whatever reason, and this, genuinely we have no idea what, what the reason was, have decided that you're a threat, if you then change their perception of you by doing something really nice, and the simplest thing is provide something to eat, if you make sure that they see you, you take a bit of food out for them and put that down for them to eat, uh, and then they associate this really good thing, a really kind and nice thing, some food for them. In almost every case I know about, and, and we've got lots and lots and lots of them now to show that this is the case, they stop attacking you because they, and then they, they remember who you are, they know who you are already, but they remember that you did this nice thing, and so probably it's a good idea to do that. And because, well, I've, a, I've raised the issue of bird feeding, this is one of my other big areas of research, um, lots and lots of people feed magpies um, and they feed them mints, like that person is now feeding that magpie mints there. Um, and we now know that that's not the best stuff to feed them. Mints just doesn't have enough calcium. It'll cause, it can cause, if they eat too much of it, uh, weakness of the bones. They will withdraw the calcium from their bones because they... Get, aren't getting enough in their diet um, and so I'm recommending other things and probably the simplest thing is little pellets of dry cat food is pretty good or some other types of things which don't which are much more um, suitable um, it's not perfect but it's a lot better than other things but those things called dog sausages that look like huge Devon rolls for uh, pets for, for dogs and cats just tiny bits of that cut up and if anybody's interested in that stuff there is a book, um, Feeding the Birds at Your Table, and that's about this very controversial topic. So that's, that's it. Um, and I'm really, I was so disappointed not to do this live, but I'm very happy to um, answer your questions if you need to have any. And I think the uh, BirdLife people will put up some details about how to um, contact me. Um, and I've also put up a series of uh, links to important papers that would... Uh, the, the data is the, the, the details that I've talked about on this in this talk uh, are there, uh, and you can find out a lot more information. So all the best, and uh, keep safe during this magpie season. Thanks very much.